All right, I am super excited here with, to be with Prashant and Patrick. Hello, Prashant and Patrick. Hi, Arun. How are you? Hi, all. Wonderful. I'm really excited to be here. Today, we're going to talk about federated learning with OpenFL. This is very timely as OpenFL was recently contributed to LFAI and data. And uh, I want to learn about what is federated learning? Why did we move OpenFL to LFAI and data? And more importantly, how to get started with OpenFL? So Prashant, tell us what is federated learning? Yeah, so the, the, the need for federated learning is that, you know, for being able to train models, to train robust AI models that can generalize um, at various locations, you need um, two aspects of data, right? You need you need large amounts of data. So as you know, that the larger the models are and with, with deep neural networks, the more data you give, the more accurate these models get. So there's a need for um, for getting access to large amounts of data, but getting access to large amounts of data is just one part of the story. You also need diverse uh, data sets because a lot of these AI systems are biased, and uh, this has been in the headlines many times. In in case of this healthcare uh, study that they did, you know, 70 70 percent of these uh, models were actually trained on data sets from California, Massachusetts, and New York, and uh, this leads to bias and and we don't want bias in medicine, right? So that's that's part of it. And then same with financial services as well. You know, you need you need access to large amounts of diverse data sets. And and but the problem is that it's not very easy to get access to data because there is a regulatory environment that we all need to operate in. Uh, it's very so, hard so to what, move. What you're saying yeah. is the volume and diversity of data both are important. That's 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 exactly right. That's exactly okay. right. You need both the volume and the diversity of data sets. But getting and, and, access the, and the reason we need that is because that improves the accuracy of the data based upon how widely the model needs to be deployed. Exactly, because one of the problems in AI is that you you can train your model and get the best accuracy with the data sets that you have that you may have gathered. But as soon as you take that model and deploy it in a completely different setting, so you know, let's say I have a model that I've trained in uh, using the data sets in California, Massachusetts, and New York. Maybe this model works really, really well in those uh, those regions. But as soon as I take that model and deploy it to a rural village in India, that model may suffer from accuracy issues. And and that generalizability of the model is actually pretty important. Uh, and that generalizability improves as you expose it to larger data sets and diverse data sets. And I'll, I'll walk you through a, uh, some of the work that we've done with the University of Pennsylvania that actually proves this. It's not just theory. We have we have actual proof on, on how these models were, were sort of improved. Very cool. But the but the real issue over here is that, you know, y y yes, you know, we need large amounts of data and you need diverse data sets, but it's not very easy, easy to get access to these type of data sets because if you think about it, healthcare data is generated in hospitals. Uh, it's patient health information. You can't go to a hospital and say, hey, I want to train the best COVID detection model. Give me your data. It's patient data. It's not It's not easy to get access to this patient data sets uh, because of the regulatory environments around the world. And, and every region of the world has a very different regulatory environment. So it's very hard to operate in these type of scenarios. And and training of data, uh, training of models is just one one part of the equation, right? You also want to validate these models in a wide variety of settings. So you may have a centrally learned model or a or a model that may have learned in a federated fashion. You also want to be able to evaluate how good is your model performing in various sites, and and in that case also you need you need access to large amounts of diverse data sets. So it's both training and inference, and then because of the regulatory environment, the data cannot leave the data center. So that all needs to happen in the local environment, so that the overall model accuracy goes up. That's 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 exactly right. That's exactly right. And so, the the traditional way of training models today, right? Let's take a healthcare example over here. Is that if you want to train a model, you get access to data sets from various institutions around the world. You you tell them, okay, de-identify all these data sets and move them to my central data center. This process takes months, if not years, because you have to negotiate all these contracts and sort of convince the CIOs and CMIOs of a hospital that 
uh, that you know this data that is moving out of the data center is 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 de-entified, and so and then you train your model and outcomes a model. But in a federated learning uh, architecture, you are actually keeping the data right where it is. You're not moving the data sets at all. Instead, what you're doing is you're moving the computation to the data. So the model is sent to each of these institutions. The model trains at these institutions locally, so the data is never moving. And then the model moves back to an aggregation server where the learnings from each of these institutions is combined into a global model. And this process continues. And it's this combined model is then sent for further training. And this loop continues until you get the accuracy that you're looking for. So the data always stays with the institute, like the hospital, the research institute, whatever it is. The model is the one that goes back and forth. And with this loop is essentially what improves the overall accuracy of the model. That's right. That's exactly okay. Right. I can talk about uh, the UPenn example, the work that we've been doing with UPenn, if that's uh, that's of interest. Or we... No, I think that's definitely yeah. of interest because you know yeah. how is this applicable? Where was this done? What prompted us to get into this field? I would love to learn about that. Okay, yeah. So, uh, so the uh, Google actually coined the term federated learning. They were doing text prediction on uh, on Android phones. So when you're typing your text message, uh, your your uh, SMS, the word prediction that happens, uh, your text message is private. So you don't you don't want Google to be reading your text messages. And so what they did was they federated these models across various Android phones and be able to create this model that does a text prediction for you. So when when Google came up with this paper, we said, hey, this is the exact problem that a lot of these uh, you know regulated industries need from from health and life sciences to financial services and others. So can we actually apply this type of concept or architecture to these type of domains? Which is when we actually worked with Intel Labs and uh, we you know there's a um, there's a group within Intel Labs um, led by Sridhar and uh, we. We essentially said that hey, this the, this privacy preserving machine learning technique sh should be explored, and we we reached out to the University of Pennsylvania that has been doing this, uh, has been collecting and centralizing these data sets, and they said, hey, we should certainly sort of apply this to healthcare because it's very hard for us to get access to these data sets. And what we ended up doing was we set up this proof of concept, and um, with ten institutions. And we first we wanted to show whether does federated learning actually work. And so with this handful of institutions, we we trained uh, trained a brain tumor segmentation model, and we showed that the accuracy of the model uh, can be achieved using a federated learning architecture without having to centralize all these data sets. And then we said, hey, we need to actually scale the study. Let's see how you know. Let's go from ten institutions in, into the United States and go to a more sort of a global study. And that federation, as soon as the hospital systems learned that you don't have to, that they don't have to actually move their physical data sets outside their hospital firewalls, the study actually grew to 71 sites around six different continents. So, so they're map, more likely to participate in that case, exactly. Exactly, exactly. And so what, what you see in this picture is all the yellow dots that you see over here are the institutions that participated in training the brain tumor segmentation. The key part over here is that the, none of these institutions actually had to move the data sets outside of their firewalls. The data sets the stayed key local. part that I'm seeing here is, is such a global challenge. We really need that global participation in this. As you talked about, even though we may be able to get the volume of data, but the diversity is data is not there, then these models are meaningless. That is exactly right. Uh, we we actually did a study. So this this nature study that you see over here at the bottom goes into the details of of the results. But that's exactly what we saw is that we had a centrally learned model, and we 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 measured the accuracy of that model, and then we took the federated model and we measured the accuracy. And the accuracy of the federated model uh, far outperformed the accuracy of the of the centrally learned model. In fact, some of the results that you see over here is that. You see 27% better accuracy on the holdout data, and then here I I glossed over this thing that you know these are all the institutions, 71 institutions. Some of these institutions had large number of data sets, and some of these had very few data sets. But even though they had few data sets, the diversity of data actually helped improve the accuracy of the model. Uh, we also 
ask ourselves a question like, what if these institutions say, hey, we have the best data set on Earth, uh, we have the largest amount of data, uh, can we actually, why do we need to participate in a federated learning study? So we, we even measured that and we found that even though they had the highest amounts of data, uh, it, it that doesn't matter. The diversity of data that that comes in actually improves uh, improves overall accuracy of these models. Well, I mean that only makes their model that much more relevant, you know, because exactly. they, in this global world, people are traveling from all over different geographies. You know, I get to work. You know, I get stuck in. You know, I am in some other country, and if God forbid something happens, you know, and if that hospital has to treat me. You know, I am an Indian living in America. Maybe I go to say Australia, and if something happens over there, then you know that diversity is so much more critical for safety of the human beings. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Very cool. So, um, tell me, what, what, how is OpenFL related to all this? Yeah. So the uh, so this study that I am talking about. So this work actually started in Intel Labs, uh, as I mentioned, as a research project to show the feasibility of this. And then a lot of people started asking us, "Hey, you know, you've done this. We basically published in Nature, which is a high-profile, uh, you know, publication. And and when people saw that, you know, this is possible, uh, they all started asking us, "Hey, give us, you know, give us the code that you used." And we said, "Okay, we cannot give research code." Uh, so we we basically decided to productize all the all the code that uh, you know Intel Labs had basically taken the leadership on, and we said, hey, we need to create a an open source product or a project that can actually um, enable others to do what we just did with UPen, right? And so that's where sort of OpenFL was born, and an OpenFL is essentially an open source um, li library that um, allows you to do this whole federated learning. It sits on top of your existing framework. So if you have a developer that is using Keras or TensorFlow or PyTorch, Jax, Flax, it, it doesn't matter. This is a layer on top of that. So we don't force a developer to go down a given deep learning framework. They can use whatever framework they want. But what what OpenFL does is that it it facilitates this entire architecture where the model is sent to each of the sites, the model is trained locally. The aggregation happens, and you can. We have all the flexibility that you know. Some people may have their own aggregation schemes that they want to use. They can implement their own aggregation. So it's a very flexible framework that sits on top of uh, your 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 existing deep learning networks. And part of the challenge also is that you know this this whole technology needs to be privacy preserving uh because your intellectual property. So let's see. Let's think about the two stakeholders over here. You have the model builder and you have the data providers from the model builders perspective uh, their intellectual property could be potentially going to uh, hospitals that may not be trusted uh, in terms of the security right you may not have the best security infrastructure in a rural part of india uh, and you may have the best security infrastructure in in, in new york um, uh, hospital in new york uh, how, how do you actually protect your intellectual property as it is training in in a potentially untrusted environment, so all of that is is something that we have considered right from the get go. On the from the data provider side, their concern is they don't want to be involved in a breach. They want to make sure that the data is secure and that the co computation that is happening on the data, uh, the models are learning about the data. So there are there are certain attacks in a federated learning system where by just inspecting the model itself you can reverse engineer what the data is and so how do you protect that from happening right how do you uh, ensure that nobody has access to these intermediate calculations uh, so that they cannot reverse engineer the data set so you're basically protecting both the data providers and the model builders from uh, from their security interests right and so what you're telling me is openfl has inbuilt mechanisms to ensure that stays to be the case Exactly, exactly. That's right. Awesome. So I think we we have not just open sourced it, but we have gone a step ahead out of that. Uh, what have we done? Yeah, yeah. So part of uh, you know part of what we've done is we, we 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 this has been part of the strategy right from the get go. Is that yes, we we created this whole open source project. It was under Intel GitHub, and we we already had a lot of people actually wanting to contribute to this particular product and you know folks from vmware um, upen was contributing to it uh, so what we said is that 
we want to actually move this to a neutral place, to a place like Linux Foundation, and and uh, like Linux Foundation, there's um, LFAI and data, which which has like several of these AI type projects within uh, like within the purview, and we move this to a neutral place so that this can really be a community driven project as opposed to an Intel driven project, right? And so we 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 will still contribute to this project, but. We want to welcome contributions from other companies, from other researchers, from academia, and grow this in ways that we haven't even imagined, right? Because uh, if, for example, VMware just contributed a compression pipeline, these weights that are going across or the models that are going across different um, aspects of the federation, they need to be, these weights can be pretty large. Now we are talking about GPT, 3 and GPT-4, these are 175 billion parameters, right? And so if you're transmitting all this type of uh, parameters across the network, you you can like, quickly overwhelm the network. So VMware has contributed something called the Eden compression pipeline that that can compress all of these weights. So these type of contributions, you know, would have never, not never, but would have taken Intel to a lot of time to build by ourselves. Absolutely. Right. Well, I mean, that's the whole value premise of you know an open source foundation. You know, a neutral copyright, neutral governance, and a more inclusive environment. And Intel was a founding member of the Linux Foundation in that sense. So we really believe in the mission of LF in general and LFAI and data. So huge shout out to Ibrahim for accepting you know and that technical steering committee essentially around LFAI and data for accepting this project. So that's pretty awesome actually. That was you know in show and tell. That's the tell part. Patrick, what do you got? To what, what do you have for us to show? How? What, uh, tell us where the GitHub repo is. What can we do? What people can do about it? How developers can get started with it today? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll share my screen here and give a, a yeah. sample of some of the things we're working on and how the community community can get involved. All right. So what you're seeing here is the OpenFL uh, public repository. So this used to sit under the the Intel GitHub organization. We've recently moved under Secure Federated AI, which is the new the new org uh, established under the Linux Foundation, where OpenFL and future projects are are going to sit. Um, so so this is the the website that you can go to GitHub.com slash Secure Federated AI uh, slash OpenFL, and that will take you to this page. Uh, we have 48 contributors across the, the lifetime of our project. Uh, we we just uh, released OpenFL 1.5, so this is our sixth release in the, the past uh, roughly two years, and we're, we're actively scoping out what uh, our, our future releases 1.6 and 2.0 and, and the future are going to look like. Um, but in, in terms of getting involved, uh, we have a, a robust issue backlog, um, and we have an upcoming hack hackathon internally, uh, so you'll see some, some issues that are tagged uh, with this hackathon label. Um, so we, we encourage anything uh, for, for new participants uh, as well as uh, seasoned OpenFL contributors to, to take up new issues that don't have uh, an owner that's already assigned to them. Um, and you can you can just look at the, the scope of, of one of these issues and uh, figure out if it's a, something that you have prior experience in or interest in in terms of working on as a, a new feature. Uh, and then the, the pull request process um, typically involves uh, creating a fork first of the OpenFL uh, repository. And then uh, once you've committed all of your code that's in uh, the scope of the, the feature or issue that you would like to work on, you can just create a, a new pull request uh, and compare mm -hmm. that to the, the develop branch. And uh, one of our maintainers, myself, others on my team and others in the, the wider community will, will take the, the opportunity to review that and uh, get these these PRs merged. So. Uh, we're, we're very welcoming and, to, to the, sorry, go ahead. No, that, that's awesome actually, because that's a very classic way how you would send. So that what you're explaining is nothing new essentially. That's how you would, you know, contribute to any project on GitHub. Open up a pull request, you know, and because this is the LF project, there is a governance model here where the maintainers would review possibly give a LGTM and then it gets merged in there. That's exactly right. Yeah, so so we 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 adhere to the standard. Uh, open source development model, and uh, we, we we try to stay consistent with the best practices in the community. And I see there is a governance.md, contributing.md. So the usual files that you would expect for you know a foundation project are in there. So tomorrow, if I become super interested in OpenFL, I could start contributing a lot of it, and then I can eventually rise to be a maintainer. 
that's that's exactly right. So for anyone who's very interested in the, the project and has a certain uh, and has been contributing for for a while, um, we would like to establish a process where there's a, a clean path to being a, a maintainer over over time. And that's one of the the, the purposes actually of, of bringing this project from Intel to the the Linux Foundation, so that we can pull in this this wider net of contributions. Amazing, amazing. Now, let's say I don't want to contribute, but I want to just use OpenFL. How would I get started with that? Absolutely. So, so we have a readme.md file on on our repository um, with the getting started section. And so, there's a couple of different uh, uh, workflows that we enable today. Uh, there is the aggregator-based workflow, which I'll be showing today. This was what was uh, used originally in OpenFL as part of our our work with uh, the University of Pennsylvania and the, the FETS initiative. Um, there's a director-based workflow, which is really useful for, for research scenarios when you don't know exactly what the, the model um, is or, or maybe the hyperparameters that are going to be used for an experiment, and it makes the, this uh, quick experimentation a pretty easy thing to do. And then most recently in the OpenFL 1.5 release, uh, we, we have a new experimental workflow interface that actually aims to address some of the, the requests of the, the wider community that Horizontal federated learning is, is great and it's easy to do with OpenFL, um, where there's very well-defined training and validation tasks for a model that run on all of the, the collaborators. But what if we have something that's just a little bit different than that and we have maybe a global validation set that we want to test on the aggregator or some interesting thing that we want to try um, as a, a custom task that's that's put into these workflows. And security and privacy use cases and our work with Intel Labs is uh, uh, there, there's there's many examples that we've we've actually been able to to pull and, and ideas that we've been thinking on for a while. So we've tried to uh, build this new interface to actually make it quite a bit easier to add this really custom, interesting functionality to extend not just from horizontal FL but into vertical FL and, and interesting uh, research ideas that can be quickly brought into our framework. Um, but, yeah, but without further ado, let me actually show you. How to and you said you're going to show us the aggregator-based workflow, so I'm excited about that. That's that's right. So so what I have here is a, a server uh, just launched in in Azure, and I'm going to show you what the process is. So we have a a command line interface for actually creating uh, what is going to be first a, a template uh, workspace. So we have a number of examples in OpenFL, and and a template is typically the place that we recommend people start. So fx is the, the command, and I'll just type the, the, the help command so we can see what's at our disposal. So and all you have done so far is pip install OpenFL? That's exactly right. So pip mm -hmm. install OpenFL on a fresh environment, and I'm just sitting in the, the demo directory across these three windows that you're seeing here. Okay. So I'm going to start by uh, typing fx workspace create. And the, the name of this directory that I'm going to create is uh, going to be just workspace. And we're going to use an existing template. And, and the templates you were talking about earlier. It, exactly. And, and Prashant had mentioned that OpenFL is framework agnostic. So uh, we have TensorFlow examples, we have Torch examples, we have JAX examples. I'm going to use a, a Torch um, uh, convolutional neural network uh, model that's being trained on a, a healthcare specific data set uh, his, uh, histology and, and classifying different tissue samples. So I'm, I'll type in a torch CNN histology and the list of the different templates that we provide. Uh, if, if you don't know what those are ahead of time, you can just type FX workspace create and then help and that will give you the whole list of, of everything that you need or one, right. one of the options that you can select. Yeah. From. Yeah. All right. So this is going to create a, a directory just called workspace underneath this this demo directory and we can see what the the hierarchy of that looks like and just diving in here to workspace we can see a couple of key folders that i'll, I'll just talk about a little bit so in the source directory we have our, our model definition ptcnn.py and just taking a look at that that is a standard uh, pytorch model uh, there is a base class, which we call a, a PyTorch task runner. So um, what this is doing internally is establishing the ways that the model weights are extracted from this model and then set back to it um, during these, these rounds of federated training. Uh, but everything else about this model looks pretty similar to, to what people should be accustomed to working with as, as a, a data scientist. Um, and there's the model definition here, the forward pass. So nothing too surprising if you're used to working with PyTorch. Uh, and then jumping 
into uh, the data loader representation. So similarly, if we go to um, uh, PT histology uh, in memory, what we see here is our interface for, for working with different uh, uh, types of, of deep learning framework data loaders. And in this case, we, we have a, uh, an internal function we're calling for loading this histology data set. It's a, it's a built-in, uh, or it, the, the data set is downloaded to this directory. And then what we're doing, because this is a demo, is just sharding across the different collaborators. So every collaborator will get a different slice of this, this data set. And we just define what the, uh, the, the training uh, features are, as well as the labels. And then we have a set of validation features and labels uh, as well. And so that's the federated learning part of it that is really spreading out across multiple nodes there. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, okay, so we've seen that. The other key piece to call out here is uh, the, the federated learning plan. So there's a step to run now and uh, FX plan initialize. What this will do is it will uh, define this initial plan that we're going to start with. Uh, and you're seeing this this data be downloaded right now. So that's downloading into a local folder. Uh, this is for the purpose of a demo. We're just using a single node, but this process would look very similar if we were running this across uh, distributed infrastructure as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so while this is completing here, here we see the the model being initialized. And and what what you're seeing as part of this is that initial model that. Um, all participants are going to start with on the first round. So the aggregator starts with this, this base model and then distributes it to all of the participants in the federation. Uh, and so if we look at this plan file, uh, just plan.yaml under the plan directory, what we see is a lot of different settings that all participants agree to before they actually start these federations. And this is pretty important because it defines what the, the model structure is going to be, um, different hyperparameters that are going to be chosen as part of the, the experiment. So you can think of the plan really as a, a contract so that people know what they're they're going to be uh, training their data on before they actually start running these experiments. And this was a key piece in terms of working with uh, these different IT sec uh, groups uh, as, as far as the, the FETS initiative goes. And uh, one of the things that we've carried forward into the open source OpenFL framework. So uh, this so is really cool, actually, because you know, with just a few commands, I could easily get started. I could tell it, you know, what framework to use, what my plan looks like, what my aggregation model looks like, what my distribution model looks like, and this kind of goes back to what Prashant was talking earlier that this is all very flexible and extensible. And Prashant, as you were talking about, that in case of VMware, if you're sending those large models, this is a very simple model. But if you're sending a large model with 175 billion parameters, for example, then you know I may not want to go this route. Then I may want to like plug in those relevant components accordingly. Exactly, and and so one of the things that is is pretty important in federated learning is also security. And so because of that, we make TLS the the default uh, implementation for for these federated learning plans. And to make things a little bit easier for people who don't have a lot of experience with, with TLS and set up, setting up certificates for themselves, we have a built-in um, uh, PKI mechanism, uh, private key infrastructure. So I'm going to type workspa FX workspace uh, certify. And what this is going to do is just create a private certificate authority. So the, this aggregator node is going to represent the trusted entity for all of the, the different collaborators verifying their certificates against. And now we're going to create the aggregator. So this is going to look like aggregator, FX aggregator. Uh, and I think generates... this is a very cool, this is a very nice feature because all you are encouraging is by default secure capabilities itself. So that oftentimes you're trying to figure out how do I set up this PKI? Where does my private key, where does my public key go? But you got this with one command, got this up and running. And now if a customer wants to plug in their actual PKI infrastructure, the plugin points are there already. Exactly, and they just put their certs where they normally would on their system, and uh, they they point to where the those paths are within the plan, and then everything should be up and running. Mm -hmm. um, so what I've done so far is created the certificate request and signed the certificate for the aggregator, and now we're going to do this uh, the the equivalent thing for each of the collaborators who are going to be part of this experiment. So if I go to the workspace directory, I'm going to do F FX collaborator generate cert request. The name will be what's called one to be creative. And so collaborator one and collaborator two, basically, yeah. 
Exactly, collaborator one, collaborator two, and what I'm putting in here is just the shard number that's identified for for this this collaborator. So it's going to be this will just give it half of the data set that was downloaded in that in that first step yeah. that you saw. And now going down to the second line, I'm just going to copy this from above and type two. And type the number two. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong directory here. That's an expected error. You know what? All, all right. All that so proves is that this is a real working demo. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you have to have the proof. Um, That's okay. Right. So, so now we have the certificate signing request. And normally, if you were using this on multiple nodes, you would send the the CSR. Um, to so so you see this uh, zip file that gets packaged here. So send that out of band to the aggregator or whoever is acting as the certificate authority. They sign that and then they yeah. send it back. But because we're yeah. operating on one node, I'm just going to go over to the aggregators window and yeah. run FX Collaborator certify for using that zip file. Yep, for certificate one or for collaborator yeah. one, and similarly yeah. for collaborator two. And we type yes to verify that that hash is what we would expect. And so you can do this out of band and, and verify that things look exactly what, how they how you would, would expect. And at this point, now all of our TLS certificates are set up. Our, our data set configuration is set up. We know that we want two collaborators and we have our initial model. So we can actually- So the pipe start... between the collaborator and the aggregator is set up. Exactly, exactly. So everything is set up at this point, And now all that's required is to actually just start the experiment. So mm -hmm. I'm going to start by running FX aggregator start in this window. And this will start a gRPC server. And then similarly down here, I will run the gRPC client, the collaborator. Mm. Now, this is gRPC because it's on the same host or would it gRPC if it's running across multiple hosts as well? It will also be gRPC across multiple hosts as well. So, uh, the, yeah, it doesn't change uh, depending on on where where you're you're running the application. There right. there is always a yeah gRPC server, and I will start collaborator one. And what you'll start seeing in the logs uh, are the different tasks that are being performed by by the different aggregators. So, uh, every collaborator goes to the aggregator to ask, "What am I supposed to be doing for this round?" Um, and so for, for this particular experiment, there's three different things that the, the collaborators are doing. They're, they're going to be downloading the model first uh, and then doing a, a forward pass, uh, doing validation uh, of the aggregated model on their, their local data. Then they'll be training uh, on their local data. And then finally, looking at that, that model that's been modified a little bit by their local data set and doing another forward pass on it um, before sending all this information back to the aggregator for some kind of, of averaging or uh, uh, ag aggregation of, of all of those weights back into that, that single model that can then be redistributed to all of the, the other collaborators again for another round. In the so on the left is the aggregator, on the right are the two collaborators. So right. the right is the one that is downloading the data, running the model, doing the training, and saying exactly. this looks good, I do a forward pass, send it back over there. And then mm -hmm. the aggregator on this side collects the two data, combine them again, and then says, here you go, round two. Exactly, exactly. So after they do their backward pass and and uh, train, have their locally trained model, then they send that model back to the aggregator. And uh, then it is combined together. Um, and the, the default implementation is just a weighted average, um, depending on the amount of data that's present at each collaborator site. So because these collaborators um, are, are dividing the data uh, equally, they'll have equal weight in terms of their representation in that global model, but that's not always the case. And uh, right. so right. so for, for the University of Pennsylvania study or the, the FETS initiative, uh, there were wildly different uh, uh, data representations between different collaborators. Um, and I would imagine it, so because I'm, I'm seeing right now is running for round four. And where do I see the accuracy of the model improving with each round essentially yes so so what you're going to be seeing here is actually um the dice or i'm sorry so it, it is going to be the um the, the accuracy in this case and um looking at uh so the locally tuned 
I'm sorry, uh, just going down to the aggregated model validation for round four, we're, we're seeing that reported right here. And at the end of the round, then we get an, a, 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 uh, a view of what the, the, the accuracy is across all the participants. I see. So oh, so this is this 68 percent right now across exactly. all the participants. And with round four and five and so on and so forth, the more rounds you run, this accuracy could likely go up. Exactly, and so the, I have good timing here because after after round four, now we're seeing uh, accuracy go up to seventy four percent. So yeah, yeah it, it generally does improve over time until it hits you know that 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 upper bound uh, where where training can can be stopped after that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can only train the model so much. It's machine after all. I know you cannot get hundred percent accuracy in these models, which is very rare. So. And again, I'm seeing it's 79%. Now it's increasing. Now it's sort of plateauing around 80% or so, which is still a pretty good accuracy for the model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's right. And we'll see it continue to improve a little bit. Um, this will go for a total of 20 rounds, uh, but but this is 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 purely serves as an example of when your data is independently and identically distributed across different participants, uh, the, the types of improvement you can expect to see. Yeah, I mean, and I think you are also looking at it at some point of diminishing returns. That from 79, it went to 80 percent, then maybe 81 percent. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I run, and because there's a compute cost associated with running the model and the training as well, so that's where you have to start thinking about how much am I investing in the training part of it, and how much is the accuracy going up, or maybe this is good enough for me. Exactly. Absolutely, yes, and that, and that was actually one of the discoveries too from the 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 FETS initiative study. Um, that they had a certain representation of, of collaborators that, that well represented the, the overall data distribution. And so they, they were able to get to nearly the, the top level of accuracy that they were once they were able to incorporate all participants. Um, right. but, so there is a, a balancing in terms of both knowing ahead of time the number of rounds that you should be training on and the types of collaborators you should be working with. Um, is, with, and balancing that with the computational uh, piece. This so. is so awesome. This is so awesome. I'm so excited to see the actual thing in working. So yeah, I mean, people can at least get a feel for it, you know, play around, replace their data, their keys, start experimenting with the federated learning in their own setup itself. Now, at the beginning of your discussion, you talked about a hackathon. You know, that hopefully that should get the developers excited. Take us back to the GitHub repo. Tell us more about that hackathon and how can developers contribute more? Yes, so so there is a hackathon that's that's happening uh, internal to Intel and the next, uh, so the 2023 Open Source Software Hackathon. Um, and the date for that, I need to pull up exactly what- Well, this is internal to Intel only though. It's internal to Intel, yes. And so this will be happening in within the next, I believe, month. Uh, and there's going to be teams across Intel who will be invited to work on this hackathon. But we hope to have similar hackathons for the external community. In the I think that's the key well. part. You know, I mean, we're probably experimenting with this to begin with, but definitely having this for the broader, wider community, you know, educating the mentors, bringing in more external contributors would be so much essential. I mean, that's the whole spirit of open source and open ecosystem is. That is fantastic, you know, Prashant and Patrick, thank you so much. You know, is there anything else that you want to say or that I should have asked and I didn't ask? No, I think you 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 have covered it all. We we have we have community meetings that uh, we we have set up in both Europe and uh, Asia and US friendly time zones where we welcome people to just show up. Uh, they can listen in. We give project updates, uh, and it's not just Intel, but even our partners are giving updates on 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 various uh, aspects of the of the project. And so that is the, so we basically invite you to come join those meetings. That those details are uh, posted in our GitHub, and we also have a Slack channel so people can sign up to Slack. All of those links are uh, in our GitHub page, so you can just click on Slack and it'll take you to like to our Slack. So. Uh, my key message over here is get involved. Uh, you know, no type of contribution is small or big, right? Get involved, get your hands dirty, give us feedback. Uh, we are all here to listen and help each other out and make make beautiful progress on this particular industry, which is uh, absolutely which is, yeah. No, you're right. And I mean, as they say in open source, you just scratch your own itch. You don't have to worry yeah. about anybody's own itch. Scratch <laughs> yeah. your own itch, and you know it makes everybody's itch so much better. So yeah. No, fantastic. I will drop a link to the GitHub repo in the show notes. 
um, and then also you know, the Slack and the other things that, that we talked about. So hopefully people will get uh, access to that. Prashant and Patrick, once again, thank you very much. This has been very helpful. I enjoyed the learning. Hopefully others do too. Thanks, thanks for having us. us. Yeah, thanks for having us.